Hello, I'm Harold Rogers. I'm uh, the co-host for the summer seminar series for, for this year, 2021. And today we have with us Bill Ambrose. And Bill Ambrose is a senior research scientist who is now retired at the Bureau of Economic Geology the University of Texas at Austin, where he holds a Master of Arts degree in Geological Sciences. He is currently um, co-chair of the Astrology Committee of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. Um, his research interest in, um, in planetary geology include energy resources in the solar system and lunar geology with an emphasis on uh, crater morphology and secondary craters associated with large impact basins. Uh, Bill has given numerous presentations on pres uh, planetary science at meetings of the uh, Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, uh, the Geological Society of America, and the aforementioned AAPG. He is a co-editor of uh, the GSA special paper 477, uh, recent advances and current research issues in lunar stratigraphy and AAPG memoir 101, energy resources for human settlement in the solar system and Earth's future in space. And today he's uh, giving a talk entitled Lunar Landscapes. So take it away, please, Bill. Thank you, Harold. Thanks for the introduction. So let's see if we can get set up here. I'll hit uh, share screen. Okay, can everybody see the full slideshow? Uh, we can. Very good. So let me select a pointer. Okay. All right, well, uh, thanks for joining me in uh, a tour of the moon today. We're gonna look at a variety of landscapes on the moon. And it's my contention that once you under, understand the processes that uh, shaped and sculpted the moon, then you can begin to make sense of all the features that exist on the moon. And there's quite a wide variety. Uh, admittedly, most of them are related to impact processes. Uh, most of the features that we see, for example, this uh, panoply from uh, Apollo 17, that's uh, Harrison Schmidt uh, near Shorty Crater. Uh, these mountains are really gigantic ejecta blocks associated with the asteroid that uh, impacted the moon and created the Serenitatis Basin uh, many billions of years ago. And uh, those mountains are rounded and sculpted, mainly the result of erosion on the moon, uh, which is dominated by, uh, over a long period of time, uh, a constant uh, impact by micrometeorites and, and other larger meteorites that have rounded out the moon. So back in the good old days of science fiction, back in the 1940s and 1950s, when uh, you're looking at uh, movies that uh, depict uh, astronauts on the moon, the mountains on the moon were depicted as uh, craggy features like the Matterhorn or uh, uh, some of the mountains, uh, the Himalayas on the earth. But, but actually a lot of the mountains on the moon are very uh, mounded in their, uh, in their appearance. And that's the result of that uh, constant erosion by micrometeorites. So uh, before we look at the types of uh, topographic features of the moon, let's briefly look at a history of the moon. Then we'll look at uh, basin scale impacts. We'll move to a smaller scale, look at craters and understand uh, and make a survey of the variety of craters that exist on the moon. There's quite a number of igneous landforms on the moon. We'll take a look at those. Uh, then we'll look at uh, scarps and rills, uh, and that includes Graben. And uh, 
then there's some interesting features on the moon, which I would group together as oddities, uh, things that we don't entirely understand and don't quite fit into the picture in terms of uh, impacts and, and the even igneous processes. And then in the last couple of slides, I'd just like to bring you guys up to date on uh, what's going on on the moon in terms of uh, exploration. So the moon, uh, most people believe that uh, the moon was created uh, as a result of a collision very early in the uh, history of the solar system of a Mars-sized planet with the Earth. It was an oblique collision as depicted here in this uh, painting, uh, this NASA painting. And uh, a lot of the uh, material uh, that uh, resulted from that collision was ejected from the solar system, but uh, some of it was retained in Earth orbit in the form of a torus or a ring, which uh, over the period of probably about 100 million years or so uh, accumulated in, uh, into a sort of a proto moon. That collision was a high energy, high temperature collision. And so the idea is that as the moon uh, accreted, it was hot and it was entirely molten. So the moon was entirely covered by a magma ocean. And given enough time, uh, it cooled and uh, there was a differentiation uh, into a, an inner core, a mantle, and um, a, a crust. And so the heavier cumulates, the pyroxenes and olivines, uh, settled down uh, in, into deeper layers. And then the, uh, the crust was composed of light felsic material, a plagioclase feldspar and potassium feldspar and uh, things like that. Later on, uh, the moon began to be sculpted by uh, collisions, mainly from uh, small planets and large asteroids. In particular, there was a period called the late heavy bombardment, and it lasted from about 3.85 to 3.92 billion years ago. And it was uh, probably the result of a disruption of uh, the asteroid belt by Jupiter migrating outward uh, from, from the sun. And so there were gravitational perturbations that resulted in a lot of material uh, being kicked out of orbit and entering in the inner solar system. And both the Earth and the moon, and indeed all the inner planets during this period of time were pelted by uh, very large asteroids and created quite a lot of the big basins that we see on the moon. And uh, these basins were eventually filled with uh, basalt because as later on, uh, due to uh, radioactive heating of the uh, moon's interior, interior uh, magma ascended and uh, then there were basaltic eruptions that nearly filled all of these basins. And so in terms of the basins, uh, you can see here with the pointer, this is the Imbrium Basin. This is the Serenitatis Basin, the uh, Sea of Tranquility or the Tranquilitatis Basin, the uh, Sea of Crises and so forth and so on. And so we can differentiate on a very large scale uh, the main regions uh, on the moon, at least on the near side. Uh, here is uh, Mari Nectaris, for example, and you can see that it's uh, very dark in appearance and that's because uh, the uh, basin floor is uh, now uh, covered with, with uh, dark basalt. And subsequent to that, there were uh, impacts of, uh, of meteors that formed all of these craters like Theophilus here and uh, Fracastorius. Notice that Fracastorius is uh, nearly filled to the brim with uh, basalt flows. So we can begin to see due to the law of superposition, what the relative uh, time frame was on the creation of some of these uh, features. So first was the giant basin that uh, formed as a result of an asteroid colliding with the moon, uh, forming uh, the Nectaris Basin. And then there were these uh, uh, craters that uh, impacted uh, Fracastorius here, and then a period of lava flooding which uh, 
nearly inundated some of these craters like Beaumont and uh, I mentioned Frank Astorius. And then after the basalt flow ceased, there was continual, uh, you know, continued uh, impacts from other meteorites, uh, meteors rather, that formed uh, some of these more modern craters like Theophilus, which uh, is uh, somewhat uh, pristine in appearance because it's relatively young compared to all these other features. The, uh, the highlands are the most heavily cratered part of the moon. Uh, and uh, you no notice that the highlands here are brighter in appearance than the basins. Uh, so in terms of reflectivity, uh, the moon is a very dark object if you uh, consider this basalt. It uh, has an albedo or reflectivity of only about 8% of the light, whereas the lunar highlands are relatively brighter and reflect oh, between 10 and 20% uh, of the light. And a lot of the, the craters that basically saturate the highlands are very, very old. There's craters upon craters upon craters. This is a very ancient landscape and uh, it's in excess of 4 billion years old. You can also see features uh, between the, the different uh, basins. For example, there's a lava flow boundary between the Sea of Serenity and the Sea of Tranquility. And you can see it here in terms of this uh, albedo contrast. These are iron rich basalts as uh, contrasted against uh, titanium rich basalts. Uh, so uh, not all of the basalt that fills all of these big basins is uh, of the same type. And, and indeed, uh, there were uh, numerous, there were dozens of lava flows over time that uh, eventually overspread and began to fill these basins. So let's look uh, at the very largest features on the moon, and these would be the basin scale impacts. And we'll look at the Orientale Basin, most of which is not visible from, uh, from the Earth. Uh, we can only see uh, just the eastern rim of the Orientale Basin. This is a photograph from Lun Lunar Orbiter 4 back in 1967 that shows the nature of the Orientale Basin. It looks like a gigantic bullseye that uh, hit the Earth. And it is, it, it is really unfortunate that um, we were only able to see just a tiny part of the Orientale Basin from the Earth because uh, had we been able to see the full basin uh, from the Earth, then I think it would have been a lot uh, more obvious what exact, exactly these big mare were uh, because this is the youngest, biggest basin on the moon. Uh, this was the very last of the big basins to form and therefore it is the best preserved. And these very large basins are known as multi-ring basins. Looking uh, at this colorful image here, this is a, a LOLA image. This is from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And uh, basically this is an altimetry map so that the deepest features are the bluest features. So this is the, the deepest part of the basin. And uh, the uh, topographically high areas are the uh, brighter colors or the red or the gray. And you can see that it's composed of multiple rings. Uh, what is thought to have happened is that after this basin formed, it uh, had a, presented a very large cavity in the moon. And, and that simply was unstable because uh, gravity eventually uh, resulted in a collapse of, uh, you know, post impact um, uh, collapse of these feature features so that uh, the uh, outer portions began to collapse inward. And you can see here in this cross-sectional view that uh, these uh, crater, or excuse me, basin walls uh, collapsed inward. And uh, you can see that they formed a ring here and there's a ring there and so forth and, uh, and so on. And so these are basically post impact uh, uh, features uh, as a result of, uh, of, of, of uh, subsidence. Eventually, uh, some Mare basalts uh, formed uh, and uh, came into uh, Mare Orientale, but didn't entirely fill uh, Mare Orientale, uh, only the, the inner part. Whereas uh, 
some of the near side basins, for example, Oceanus procolarum, uh, which is highlighted here by the, the laser pointer. Uh, the basalt uh, floods were so thick that they eventually obscured uh, the, the, the basins and the, and the rings that were underneath. Uh, here's sort of a gee whiz view of the Orientali Basin from, uh, from a perspective. I mean, it's, it's just really a dramatic object. Uh, the Embryum Basin is, uh, if you look at uh, the moon from the Earth, uh, it occupies the northwest quadrant. And uh, the Embryum Basin, uh, and you can see here, from a, a series of paintings from National Geographic magazine that initially there was a giant asteroid that slammed into the Embryon Basin, oh, probably about 3.9 billion years ago. Uh, this is what it probably looked like uh, before the period of uh, basaltic eruptions. And then basalt eruptions began to, to fill uh, Mari Embryon. And then this is the present day uh, view of Mari Embryon. Uh, the interesting thing is that on the southeast margin of uh, Mari uh, Imbrium, there's a series of grooves, and you can see it here. This is a photograph which uh, on this scale is just off the, the image here. This is the crater Ptolemaeus and Alphonsus, and you can see these gigantic grooves that are cutting right across the image here. It is believed that these grooves were created by all the ejecta that came out of uh, the, uh, as a result of the impact. And these were mountain-sized blocks that were hurled out at uh, nearly horizontal geometries and just basically scoured uh, this part of the moon. And this is known as uh, Imbrium Stulture. And it was first recognized, interestingly enough, in the 1890s by G.K. Gilbert who uh, published his findings in uh, an obscure, at least relative to uh, the Europeans who were leading the field of uh, uh, selenography, which is the study or the mapping of the moon. Uh, he, he published it in the, I think, the Annals of the Carnegie uh, Institute. And so um, it was largely ignored for a very long time, but this was excellent evidence of the impact uh, origin of uh, the Embryon Basin. For many, many years, it was believed by most lunar scientists, at least you know, well up into the 1950s and 1960s, is that all, almost all of the features on the moon were the result of giant volcanoes. And uh, there are volcanoes on the moon. Uh, they're no longer, uh, no longer uh, actively uh, erupting. Uh, but by and large, the, the volcanoes on the moon are tiny, tiny little features. Uh, nothing uh, in terms of scale compared to uh, the impact basins. Part of the Imbrian Basin uh, is preserved in terms of the rings, but you have to know exactly where to look for them. For example, the outer ring here is really this collection of mountains, uh, the Apennine Mountains. Uh, Mount Hadley is located here on the southeast margin of the Imbrian Basin. And it was visited by uh, Apollo 15. And here's a picture of uh, the lunar rover when Apollo 15 was there. And uh, here is Mount Had Hadley. This is basically just part of this big outer ring of uh, ejecta uh, features uh, as a result of the impact uh, that created the Imbrian Basin. And uh, you may not. Uh, get an impression of great height here, but this is in excess of 15,000 feet. This is a, a 15er, as they say. So some of these mountains are you know, fairly impressive in terms of their height, but you can see they're, it's very uh, sculpted into sort of a roundish type feature. Some of the inner ring of the Embrian Basin barely pokes out from the basalt floods. So uh, for example, here are the, the Tenerife Mountains and the Spitsbergen Mountains are here. So some of the inner ring, very a tiny amount of it is actually preserved. It wasn't entirely inundated. And let's take a look at uh, the Spitsberg Mountains, formerly known as the Montes uh, Spitsbergen. Uh, and here they are right here. 
And uh, this is a drawing of the Spitsberg, uh, Spitsbergen Mountains by uh, an Englishman by the name of Harold Hill, who was probably uh, the foremost um, uh, amateur astronomer who made drawings of the lunar surface. This is actually a, 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 a pen, uh, an ink drawing of uh, Monte's uh, Spitsbergen. And he used a very large uh, Newtonian reflector to, to make these, these uh, drawings. You might think from this drawing that uh, because of the length of these shadows and also the sharp nature of these shadows, that these are craggy, very rugged features. But actually the, the Spitsbergen Mountains is a collection of very low mounds. And here's a, an oblique image from Apollo 15 that shows how how rounded they are really are in appearance. And so uh, these uh, shadows can be a little deceptive. They may make you believe that uh, these lunar features are uh, actually have, uh, are very sharp, but uh, almost all of them uh, are rounded in, in, in view. So now let's look at craters. We're gonna reduce the scale of our investigation. Craters come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Um, and a, almost a, a baffling array. It's kind of hard to, to make sense uh, actually of, of crater morphology uh, until you understand that uh, crater morphology is uh, directly related to the, the, the scale of the crater. And I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, this is sort of a gallery of drawings that uh, I have made. Um, I'm no Harold Hill, but uh, I try to make uh, some lunar drawings now and then. Uh, this is a crater pair, Theophilus and Cyrillus, and just by law of superposition, you can see that Theophilus is a younger crater relative to Cyrillus, simply because it, it overlaps it. Here's a crater called Hanstein. This is in the uh, southwest quadrant of the moon. It has a rather flat floor, and it has these mounds uh, within the crater floor. This is... Um, a drawing of many, many craters, sort of a crater field. This is also in the southwest quadrant of the moon. And it shows a, a wide variety of different crater shapes. You have these simple craters here, uh, which are in a very large collection that are overlapping this greatly degraded large crater called Darwin. Uh, and this is named after the author of The Origin of the Species, by the way. And then a crater called Kruger, which is nearly filled to the brim uh, with basalt. Um, and so not every crater is created equal. They have a, a different uh, type of uh, morphology. The small craters tend to be simple in their uh, appearance and also their cross-sectional geometry. Uh, typically uh, on the moon, if uh, they are under 15 kilometers in diameter, they all tend to be very simple, uh, a symmetrical bowl uh, is their cross-sectional shape. And, um, and by the way, they're very easy to draw. Uh, I love making drawings of simple craters on the moon. Here's a drawing of Tobias Meyer C and D. Uh, this is um, not too far from the crater Copernicus and you can see that they're very simple craters. And uh, craters of that scale the gravitational force was not sufficient enough to produce any post-cratering slumping. And so they've basically been able to preserve their simple bowl shape. But larger craters that are greater than 15 kilometers in diameter, there's been post-cratering gravitational collapse, modification of the crater floor. For example, Langrenus, this is on the eastern limb of the moon, uh, is uh, different from those simple craters uh, in that it has these terraces. And this is the result of, of, of collapse of all the, the crater, the outer crater rim uh, due to gravitational accommodation. Also, there's a, a um, process called isostatic rebound where the, you get these inner uh, mountains in the middle of, of the crater result of uh, isostatic rebound. And uh, typically when you get up to uh, more than uh, say 40 kilometers across, uh, 
these modified craters will have these uh, central mountain peaks. Arzichel, for example, which is about 60 kilometers in diameter, has uh, these, uh, this uh, central uh, uh, peak. And they can be uh, uh, well over 1,000 feet high. Um, some are even as high as about 3,000 feet. So uh, these are not inconsiderable objects. Some of the very youngest craters, and they belong to uh, an, an era called the Copernican. Uh, so everything that's about 600 million years old or less is in the Copernican uh, era. And uh, these craters are usually, because they're young, they, there hasn't been enough time for them to be modified by uh, subsequent impacts. And so uh, they're very sharp in appearance. And, all, and also if uh, they're uh, deep enough, they're very bright because they have cut through, uh, the impact has cut through the basalt floor and has excavated some of that bright anorthosite, that feldspar rich material and, and brought it up to uh, the lunar surface. And uh, Copernicus, for example, which is the type crater for the Copernican, is just south of the, uh, the rim of the Imbrian Basin. And uh, here is a closer view of Copernicus. Uh, it is about 93 kilometers across. Interestingly enough, it's almost at the same scale as the caldera up in Yellowstone in Northwest uh, Wyoming. Although uh, its origin is entirely different. It's due to an impact. It's not a volcanic uh, related caldera at all. It has well-developed uh, central peaks. And uh, if you were to drop down into Copernicus, this is an oblique view from Google Moon. We are actually uh, inside Copernicus. We're looking westward. And you can see that these uh, central peaks here are uh, several thousand feet in height. Here's the crater floor. And then we're looking westward at all these terraces that make up the western boundary of uh, Copernicus. Some craters uh, have been nearly obliterated by uh, post-impact basalt uh, flows. Uh, here's a crater in La uh, called Lassell in Mare Nubrium, and it is reduced almost to basically a ring. It has a flat floor, which has the same sort of uh, tone or, or hue as the surrounding basaltic material because it was nearly uh, flooded with, uh, with basalt. Here's a view of uh, Plato. Plato is in the northern part of, uh, of the moon uh, on the near side. And Plato has a, this beautiful, smooth, dark floor. This is all basalt that uh, intruded into, uh, originally intruded and then extruded or flowed out on the, the floor of, of Plato, uh, almost up to the brim. You can see that they're uh, the, the remnant rim of Plato. And then uh, it is, uh, was hit by, subsequently by all these little craterlets. And there's dozens of these tiny little craterlets. And if you have a sort of a modest uh, garden variety telescope, uh, it is a challenge to see these craters. These are all very tiny craters. They're less than one kilometer in diameter. But if you have a very large telescope, you should be able to see some of the larger of these craters. There's also an interesting type of crater called a low am, uh, angle impact crater. So it takes a very low angle of impact to actually produce what we would call an elongate crater. Uh, even at a, a, an impact of say 30 degrees, uh, because the crater is, the subsequent crater, crater is much larger than the impact or almost all of the um, craters that result from low angle impacts look uh, perfectly uh, round. And it's not until you get down to about 15 degrees or less that one finally sees asymmetric or teardrop shaped craters uh, that uh, reflect the impact of, of uh, a very, very low angle uh, incoming uh, meteors. And here's some examples. This is Alphonsus B and uh, Abel Feta D. These are both, uh, this is in the central part of the moon as we see it on the near side, and this is from the Southern Highlands. Uh, 
These shapes have been experimentally reproduced uh, by Don Wilhelms, uh, who passed away recently, uh, Galt and Wedekind, uh, 1978, and also Peter Schultz at the uh, Ames Research Center has, a, uh, has a, an apparatus where he shoots uh, small uh, either you know, pellets or glass beads uh, at very high uh, rates. Uh, like a kilometer to a, a second uh, into a sandy substrate. And he's been able to almost entirely reproduce some of these shapes at, at, at low angles. There's a real oddball pair of craters in the eastern part of the near side in what we call the uh, Sea of Fecundity that uh, had a lot of people puzzled for many years. They're called Messier A, uh, Messier and Messier A. Uh, they used to be called William Pickering, who was the brother of Edward Pickering, who was the director of the Harvard uh, Observatory uh, about 100 years ago. This is a very strange pair of craters. They're both elongate, but they have a peculiar morphology. Uh, this one in particular, uh, Messier, uh, has uh, this material on its uh, western flank. And then there's this. Uh, bifurcating bright ray here, uh, which uh, proceeds for many kilometers uh, westward from uh, Messier. And the, uh, the ongoing explanation uh, apparently is that this is actually the result of only one impactor that came in so low that it actually skipped on the lunar surface and created a second impact before it uh, proceeded downrange. And here is a, uh, we're looking downrange. Uh, this is from a, a Google Moon perspective and, and it shows these, these oddball paracraters. And then this is the ray that resulted from uh, basically excavation of lunar material uh, to, to the west. Uh, so, uh, not too many examples of what we call paired craters that may be the result of actually saltation or skipping uh, on the lunar surface by a single impactor. There are igneous landforms on the moon. Obviously, there are uh, ancient lava flows, but there are also uh, remnant volcanoes on the moon. First, we'll look at some of the lava flows, which many of which have been mapped in great detail. And, uh, were photographed both by lunar orbiter and by the uh, Apollo astronauts. Uh, this is a photograph from the Apollo 15 mission from the western margin of uh, Mare Imbrium that uh, shows that there's a whole series of, of lava flows that, uh, that cut across these uh, so-called wrinkle ridges. These arrows here indicate the direction of the lava flow or the basalt flows. Uh, that uh, filled uh, the Imbrian Basin. These were very high temperature uh, basalts and uh, very low viscosity basalts. They probably had the viscosity of hot motor oil and uh, moved at a very, very rapid uh, rate of motion. Uh, there's no way that uh, a person, uh, had they been there, uh, could have outrun some of these lava flows. Very similar, uh, probably, um, to the Hawaiian lava flows. Uh, this is from Hawaii that shows this sort of braided pattern as a result of basalt flowing out of the, out of the cone. There are also what we call uh, fire fountains. Um, and uh, the Aristarchus Plateau, which is in the northwest quadrant of the moon, is a very uh, old, structurally uh, stable area. I'm outlining it here with uh, the pointer. And uh, this is from uh, the Apollo 15 um, mission. This is the crater Aristarchus, which is one of the youngest features on the moon. It, it's very bright uh, because, uh, again, uh, the impact that created Aristarchus excavated this uh, bright uh, feldspathic material. But it has these interesting sinuous features here, uh, which we call rills. And originally, it was thought by William Herschel, who observed uh, this feature back in the 1780s. He thought that it was the result of uh, valleys that were carved out on the lunar surface uh, by running water 
Uh, now, we, we now know that there was never really sufficient uh, gravity on the moon uh, or an atmosphere on the moon to promote the stable occurrence of, of liquid water on the moon. And uh, so uh, the, the theory is that this is, uh, these sinuous uh, valleys were actually carved out by, by lava flows. Uh, that many of which originally came out as fissure eruptions and produced these, these fire fountains. Here's another example of a rill that's uh, related to uh, volcanic activity. This is uh, Hadley Rill. This is on the western margin of Mari Imbrium, and it shows this wonderful sinuous feature here. By the way, there's the landing site of Apollo 15 and uh, the astronauts actually walked up to the reel and photographed uh, the reel. And so, so you can see the Apollo 15 astronaut right here. And we're looking uh, at this sinuous reel and there's the valley uh, right there as we go back. And then the, there are the mountains, which are the big ejecta blocks that form the, the margin of Mare uh, Imbrium. Looking closely, you can see that uh, the bank of the rill, you can actually see a little bit of structure here. These are basically horizontal basalt flows that form these vesicle sheets. So this is all igneous material, lava flows that were then cut into by younger lava flows. But there are also uh, some other volcanic features that we call domes, and they typically tend to be tiny. Uh, hardly any of them are more than uh, say 12 kilometers across. These are the, some of the tiniest features on the moon and many of them have a little pit at the top. And so these are uh, you know, basically silica rich uh, igneous domes that are preserved on the moon. And this is the best field is from Oceanus Procolarum, which is this very large expanse of uh, basalt on the Western uh, side of the near side of the moon. These are probably uh, like shield volcanoes, although these were probably silica rich features as opposed to uh, uh, more mafic rich features that produce the shield volcanoes, but they have probably a similar morphology. We've also noted or discovered a lot of these domes on the far side of the moon. This is Compton Belkovich, which was written up in a paper by Brad Jolliffe in 2011. Some of these domes are actually associated with uh, elevated levels of thorium and uranium, uh, some up to 55 or even maybe 90 uh, parts uh, per million uh, of, of thorium. And this is a close up view by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter of the Elrond camera of Compton uh, Belkovich. And you can see that it's weathering into boulders and a similar type of weathering uh, we believe it exists uh, on the earth. For example, here's uh, uh, igneous material from South Africa that has, uh, has, uh, has eroded out into boulders or a, a closer example uh, here closer to home would be enchanted rock, for example. There's also some very peculiar features which we think are some of the youngest features on the moon. And these are irregular Mari patches. And many of them are associated with structurally uh, weak areas on the moon. Uh, for example, this Graben here, this is uh, between Mari Embryum and Mari Tranquilitatis. And a lot of these features are uh, albedo bright features. For example, the, this uh, sort of patchy bright material here in uh, Sausagenes uh, IMP. They're tiny features. This is one kilometer scale. And also within the Sea of Tranquility, masculine uh, IMP, which uh, is a very unusual feature here. Uh, smooth, irregular. It, it sort of looks like cheesecloth almost, uh, patchy. And, and hardly any of these features, these bright albedo features, have uh, craterlets, uh, whereas the, the terrain outside is, is uh, very heavily, uh, you know, has a dense uh, cratering. Uh, essentially, the, the smoother the, uh, the, the material on the surface, uh, the younger it is. 
there hasn't been enough time for cratering to uh, to wipe out and to garden these features. And so it's believed that uh, a lot of these features are only on the order of say 20 to 50 million years old. And that's almost yesterday in terms of uh, lunar volcanism uh, because the last uh, uh, confidently dated uh, basalt flows on the moon are on the order of, uh, it, depending on who you believe, either 2 billion years ago or about 3 billion years ago uh, because the moon subsequently has cooled off but not apparently not entirely enough to produce what we call these volatile rich sort of ex exhalative type deposits. This is not really lava per se, but it's probably uh, the result of degassing or venting a volatile rich material, which is deposited uh, on the surface of the moon. There are also features called scarps and rills. We'll look at uh, the straight wall. This is in Mari, Nubri Mari Nubium. And uh, this actually is a lunar scarp. And interestingly enough, it's on the eastern margin of, of uh, Mari Nubium. Nubium. Uh, many of these features tend to be on the margins of, of big basins. And so they're probably related to post uh, impact uh, gravitational settling. And you know, here's a, a, a rill that accompanies uh, the straight wall. We believe for many years that this uh, straight wall was probably. Uh, a very high relief jagged feature. And for those of you who are uh, fans of the original Outer Limits uh, TV show that uh, aired from 1963 to 1964, there was an episode called Moonstone where uh, this uh, particular backdrop was uh, featured in uh, the show. And this was supposed to be what the straight wall uh, was supposed to look like. But in actuality, it's nothing like that at all. It's a very low relief feature. And I'm gonna show you a Google moon image of the straight wall. And so this is what we thought it used to look like. This is what it really looks like. It's a real subtle feature. It's proceeding north south. So we're looking north, sort of northeast here and uh, drop down maybe just a few hundred feet over this scarp. But it's enough of a topographic relief there to, to produce a, a shadow. I'll go back one and you can see that here's the shadow that is uh, caused by just that bare uh, topography that exists there. Now we'll get into some really peculiar features that I'll collectively call oddities. There are these things called crater chains and there are several of them on the moon. Uh, this is uh, the, the Latin uh, form of uh, crater is the word catena. So this is catena davy. And it's called catena davy because it's a, it's a chain of craterlets that goes across the crater davy, which I'm outlining here. Uh, we don't think that uh, these are uh, igneous features. And it's unusual, you know, why would we expect just if cratering is random, why would we expect all of them to be aligned like this? Well, one explanation might be that these craters all happened at the same time, and they do indeed have about the same level of uh, sharpness or maturity. Probably the result of uh, an impactor that strayed too close to the moon and became gravitationally disrupted. It might've been a comet or something. Uh, maybe like a, a, a stony uh, meteorite, which uh, is very, has a very poor level of cohesion. And maybe uh, it would be something like uh, the comet uh, Shoemaker-Levy, which approached too close to Jupiter, broke apart, and then the individual fragments uh, collided into the, the atmosphere of Jupiter uh, along this sort of arcuate uh, path right through here. And so uh, this crater chain indeed might be a smaller scale version of something like the impact of Shoemaker-Levy 9. There are also uh, uh, slumps and landslide deposits on the moon. This is from the crater Danielle, which is on the northeast margin of the Sea of Serenity. And these are Elrock photographs, and you can see that uh, these are very uh, bright 
and uh, smooth uh, images uh, material, which uh, has um, probably the result of uh, slumping that uh, came down from the eastern margin of the crater Danielle. Uh, now, what uh, what produced this slumping? Uh, you know, there are several ways to to get that. It could just be simple uh, you know, gravitational collapse or uh, possibly the result of a nearby impactor that created a, a seismic event that, uh, that shook up the area and uh, caused uh, this, uh, this landslide to happen. And it was probably a recent landslide because uh, it's so smooth and doesn't have a very uh, high crater density. There are also some really bizarre oddities on the moon, uh, some of which people no longer believe uh, the origin that was ascribed to them. Uh, there was a, an amateur astronomer named Franz von Greitheisen, who lived in, I believe, the 18, 1700s and the 1800s, who published what he thought was a lunar city. Uh, and he uh, published a paper in which he had drawings of what he called lunar avenues and lunar streets. He actually thought that he was seeing uh, an abandoned city on the moon. Uh, here's a drawing by Harold Hill, I mentioned him before, that shows a lot of these features that Greitheisen uh, imagined to be a city are uh, actually big scour features, most of which have a northwest to southeast type of orientation. What uh, Greitheisen believed to be a city was probably that Imbrium sculpture, which I mentioned before which is the result of big ejecta blocks being hurled out of the Imbrian Basin at very low angles and creating these radial valleys that uh, cut across. But even in the 1800s, when Greitheisen uh, presumed that uh, he had come across a lunar city, uh, there were still quite a few skeptics uh, even then. There's some really oddball features on the moon called lunar swirls. And they just really don't fit the, the norm as to you know, what, what, what these things really are in terms of uh, you know, craters or, or volcanic eruptions or whatnot. Uh, they're typically bright albedo uh, images. Uh, they have absolutely no topograph topographic relief whatsoever. Uh, they're bright and uh, they're very patchy. And sometimes uh, one encounters, this is on the far side of the moon, these uh, features that uh, form you know, sort of swirly patterns, and that's why they're called lunar swirls. And there are several places on the moon where uh, these uh, have been observed. Reiner Gamma is on the near side of the moon, and it's this bizarre irregular feature uh, that uh, covers uh, this dark basalt, and you can see some of the swirl type morphology on the margin of Reiner Gamma. Here's another example. This again is from the far side of the moon. This is Mari and Genii. Uh, and you can see that uh, it really does indeed live up to uh, its name sake of being a swirl. A lot of these features have arcuate geometry. They're less weathered than the surrounding uh, uh, country rock or topography. No topographic relief that uh, really can be detected. But they're also associated, at least most of them, with uh, very weak magnetic fields. Uh, this uh, particular one in uh, Mari and Genii is on the uh, order of about 20 nanoteslas, but uh, it, it does indeed have a, some sort of remnant magnetic field. Many of them are located at the antipodes of large basins, which is an interesting type of feature. Uh, and so, for example, the uh, Marangenii, which we, uh, we were looking at the swirl, happens to be located uh, almost directly opposite on the other side of the moon relative to the Imbrian Basin. This is a gravity map of the moon and it, uh, from Grail, and it shows where uh, the Imbrium antipode is. And so, um, you know, what Maybe what was the, the result of, uh, of this? Maybe it was uh, seismic activity that, uh, that was focused, it propagated through the moon and uh, you know, basically agitated that, that part of the moon. Uh, and, uh, the, and the remnant paleomagnetism is still present. 
Uh, but there are uh, several competing hypotheses. One is a comet uh, hypothesis um, that uh, impacting comets uh, left uh, these, these type of features here. Um, but we, we believe that other planets in the inner solar system have had uh, impacts from, from comets, uh, in particular uh, Mercury, uh, but we really haven't uh, detected uh, similar features on Mercury uh, to any degree. Uh, the reason why these features uh, are maybe still uh, uh, haven't been weathered is, is maybe uh, they, uh, because of the weak magnetic field, but maybe there's some sort of solar wind uh, shielding that uh, helps keep the albedo, um, the high albedo of these features, because given enough time, uh, a dark object on the moon will become lighter and a lighter object on the moon will become a little uh, you know, it will change too as a result of gardening through micrometeorite impacts. Um, another hypothesis is this is electrostatic dust movement. We do know that such thing do, processes do exist on the moon, but it doesn't uh, really uh, explain compositional differences between uh, the dark uh, areas and, and the light areas. Uh, and so the jury is still out on what these features are actually. So I'm about done with the talk, but I'd like to bring you guys up to date as to what's going on uh, right now on the moon. Um, several countries are involved in exploring the moon. Uh, China, for example, has a whole series of probes called the Chang'e probes. And uh, Chang'e uh, 5, for example, um, which uh, was sent, sent out, actually returned a lunar sample, 1.7 kilograms of material from the near side of the moon uh, back in uh, December uh, last year. Uh, Chang'e 6 uh, is the far side sample return mission. Uh, Chang'e 7 will be a survey mission to the South Pole. And this is important because we believe that uh, deposits of water ice exist at, uh, at or near both of the poles uh, on the moon. And that's the subject perhaps of another talk, but there are these, uh, uh, deep shadowed uh, areas, actually areas that have not seen sunlight for at least 3 billion years, that uh, because they're so cold, they're only a few degrees above absolute zero, that any volatiles that are trapped in these uh, dark areas, these sunlit areas, which are typically crater floors, have been retained through time. And so these are areas that uh, everybody is keenly interested on in exploring and characterizing and eventually mining uh, for the, the, the uh, ice deposits because ice, uh, water ice uh, consisting of hydrogen and oxygen is basically rocket fuel. Hydrogen would be the fuel and oxygen would be the oxidizer. Uh, Chang'e 8 is gonna test technologies uh, for a future moon base. At the same time, um, well, before I get to that, here's a, a, a fisheye view of, uh, from the Chang'e 5 uh, lander. And uh, you can see that this is a very large expanse of basically basalt and some of these uh, rounded hills in the, the, the background. But I wanted to talk also about the Artemis mission. This is a, a NASA-based mission that's gonna get astronauts back uh, to the moon, possibly as early as the year 2024, if a, if a schedule is kept. There will be a space launch system uh, not quite as uh, tall as uh, the Saturn V, only just uh, a few dozen uh, feet uh, shorter than the Saturn V rocket, but uh, there will be uh, solid rocket boosters that uh, help get uh, uh, it into low Earth orbit and subsequently uh, the upper stages will uh, get uh, astronauts to the moon. There will be four astronauts as opposed to, uh, to three in the Apollo missions. And uh, the goal is to, of course, have a series of lunar surface missions with the ultimate goal of creating a moon base. And so the timetable for Artemis, uh, we'll look at 2021 at the top going down to the year 2024. And there's this whole uh, sort of alphabet soup of, of different types of submissions in Artemis. And I'll walk you through that. First, there's the CLPS mission, which is commercial lunar payload services. Uh, a whole battery of instruments are planned uh, for the lunar surfaces, magnetometers, uh, 
scintillometers. Uh, we want to mo monitor the solar wind. Uh, for example, we want to monitor the radiation atmosphere and also uh, look at, uh, you know, get samples from uh, the lunar regolith or, or the soil. Then there's the VIPER uh, task or subtask. It stands for Volatiles Investigation Polar Exploration Rover. Uh, we'll actually have a rover on the moon, uh, much in the way that we have had rovers and have, have currently a rover on Mars. And these will take polar soil samples with the idea of really getting a firsthand look at what the concentrations of water ice are at the poles. Uh, there will also be a, a testing of a nav navigational systems in low lunar orbit, uh, otherwise known as LLO, uh, by LLO by the capstone uh, CubeSat. Uh, and then finally, a, an uncrewed, uh, uncrewed mission to test uh, high-speed Earth uh, reentry. Uh, this uh, uh, may be as early as uh, the latter part of next year. Uh, power and propulsion element, uh, PPE, and uh, habitation and logistics outpost will follow. We're uh, then starting to get serious about returning humans. And then finally, a 10-day crewed uh, test flights, uh, testing navigational, communication, and life support systems. And then uh, finally, in 2024, a uh, an actual human return to the moon, uh, as represented by Artemis III. And uh, SpaceX so looks like that will be the, the rocket system uh, that will get us uh, back to the moon. So I just wanted to bring you up to date on uh, sort of a thumbnail sketch of where we are on uh, returning to the moon so that we can uh, firsthand uh, visit these lunar landscapes and all the really interesting features that exist up uh, on the moon. And uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention and I'll be uh, glad to take uh, uh, take questions. All right. If anybody has any questions, you either drop them in the chat or you can unmute, unmute yourself and ask them. Uh, there's a question from uh, Robert Reed. Uh, did, uh, did you say boulder formation by weathering? Yeah. So the weathering is not the type of weathering that we are accustomed to here on the earth. You know, a lot of weathering here on the earth, of course, is from uh, wind and rain. Uh, probably the weathering that exists on the moon is uh, twofold. It's a continued, continuing gardening by micrometeorites, subsequent impacts. Uh, but also there's a huge temperature differential on the moon. Uh, a, a typical place on the moon, let's say an equatorial region, the daytime temperature could be 250 degrees Fahrenheit, and the nighttime temperature could be, say, 200 below Fahrenheit or more. And so there's a lot of, of uh, you know, contraction and expansion thermally that, that breaks up material. A uh, question from Ken, Ken Wissian, can you speak to any differences in crater morphology on icy bodies uh, versus rocky? Uh, so we, we do have a, a lot of examples on Mars, for example, of uh, impacts into the Martian substrate, which is uh, full of permafrost, by the way, both in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And a lot of the craters uh, into uh, those areas on Mars are very smooth in appearance. And uh, also the interior of the crater has been modified. Uh, quite a lot. Uh, you, know, you have mounded geometries and, and things like that. Uh, we don't really have any good uh, examples of uh, craters on the moon in which the morphology was modified by, um, by ice because there probably just wasn't enough, uh, high enough of a concentration of ice in the marsh, excuse me, the, the lunar substrate to produce any sort of modification. And as a matter of fact, most of the ice that we believe exists on the moon was introduced post-cratering uh, anyway, um, as a result of maybe uh, ejecta of, of ice-rich uh, comets or, or asteroids, some of which fell into these uh, permanently shadowed re regions and was retained. Any of that material that uh, came back uh, onto the lunar surface in uh, 
the uh, sunlit part of the, of the moon, the equatorial regions or you know, uh, so-called temperate regions, uh, that was quickly lost due to sublimation and evaporation. Question from Jeff Payne, what are the remaining major questions about the moon from a geologic perspective and where can geologists uh, contribute? Um, yeah, so um, there's, there's still a lot that we don't know about, you know, why does the, the moon have such a great a asymmetry in terms of uh, crustal thickness? And I didn't go into that. Uh, although I could have, I suppose. Uh, the near side crust on the moon is quite thin compared to the far side crust, uh, maybe about 30 kilometers on the near side. And on the far side, uh, the, the lunar crust is 70 kilometers thick, typically even up to 90 kilometers uh, thick. And so there's been a, a big uh, asymmetry uh, of crustal thickness on the moon. It may be related to tidal stresses uh, through time because the moon very early in its history was sort of gravitationally or tidally locked uh, so that it presents uh, only one face always uh, with, with respect uh, to, um, to the earth. Uh, there are other questions as to um, you know, where um, the greater concentrations of uh, radionuclides are. We, we do believe that uh, there's a lot of uh, thorium and uranium that's uh, associated with silica rich domes, but there's also very broad expanses probably on the near side of the moon where um, there are elevated levels of uranium and thorium. And we're only talking of, of say maybe, maybe 10 to 40 parts per million, maybe related to late stage uh, crystallization of mag magmas. Uh, these are known as creep, uh, potassium rare earth element phosphorus uh, materials. Uh, but we really haven't, uh, we sort of know where they are generally on the moon, but we haven't really mapped them in, in great detail, at least at the prospectivity level. So that's probably something else that, uh, uh, that can be done. And there's a number of geomorphic, uh, and that's really not the word I should use, I suppose. Selenomorphic is probably a better term features on the moon uh, that can be mapped in, in much more detail. Uh, certainly the LROC camera uh, has uh, pinpointed and shown these features, but a, a survey team of geologists on the moon uh, could map in, in great detail uh, a lot of, uh, of, of the interesting features that are up there, like wrinkle ridges, which I didn't really get into, uh, and rills, and, and landslide deposits and, and things like that. And uh, I know that uh, I can speak, uh, and I'm sure Jeff uh, agrees with me that we have a dedicated team here at the Bureau that has mapped a whole bunch of coastal features in the Gulf Coast, and they can use that expertise and take that to the moon. Other questions? Any answers? <laughs> well, if uh, nobody has any more questions, either in the chat, I think we're caught up there. And any more questions or comments, I'd like to, uh, to again, thank Bill Ambrose for his uh, uh, fantastic talk on lunar landscapes today. Um, and uh, don't forget next week, we do have another talk uh, coming up. And uh, let's see, do I have the presenter in front of me right now or not? But anyway, um, more to come on next week's talk um later in the week or early next week so watch your emails and thanks for tuning in today uh, and we'll see you all a little later have a safe and happy fourth of july and um a good weekend everybody thanks <laughs>
Thanks.